talk about my life. I have a, a whole bunch of stuff in my head that I think I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, some of you have heard me before. A few years ago I was here. Your task is to figure out the three things that are different this time than last time you heard me. When I have the opportunity to talk about my life, I have a whole list of stuff in my head I think I talk about. I think I'm going to talk about uh, the future and how you're going to get yourself into the future, which is unknown and unknowable and so fragile you can't believe it. I mean, I know you'll tell me what you're going to be doing six months from now, but if I want to get out my money clip and start betting, all bets are off. You know, there's nobody in this room could have predicted what's going on in the Ukraine six months ago. Nobody in this room. So that future, I think I talk about how we deal with our problems. I think I talk about how we uh, interact with each other and communicate with the people around us. I think I talk about how you exercise the influence that you have. I think I talk about how you deal with your problems. I think I talk about uh, how you're going to deal with the tragedy that's coming in your life and tragedies coming in your life. Some of us already had tragedy in our lives. I think I talk, actually, when I start to think about what am I talking about, in my head, this list gets longer and longer and longer. And I want to talk about all those things for a few minutes this afternoon by means of an analogy. An analogy is, this is a test. There's no free lunch here. An analogy is a story, a comparison. I'm going to tell you a story. The inference is somehow we could make a connection between this story I want to tell you and that list of stuff I started on. Now, I know from experience that I can make a few connections, and so if I can make a connection and I can think fast enough, I'll, I'll try to do that. But more interesting to me, at any rate, I've discovered over time that you can make lots more connections than I can make. So I would like for you to hang in there for a little while this afternoon, after lunch, with this question burning uppermost in your mind. So what? So what do I care what that guy says? Why would I even listen to that guy? So what? So what? I'd like for you to be doing real-time integration. <clears throat> now, the analogy goes like this. I'm pretty sure, just from looking at you, that everybody in this room has had at least one thing happen to you in your life, maybe more than one for some of us, but at least one thing happened to you in your life that was so emotionally charged up, uh, had so much impact on you, is so significant in your experience, that if I ask you to think about it right now, it'd be like it happened this morning. I mean, on rare occasions, something will happen to us that is so charged up, that is so emotionally loaded, that it we, it's kind of indelibly burned into our brain, that we just carry it around with us all the time. For me, one of those things happened on the 31st of August, 1967. <clears throat> I know how long ago that was, and I know for some of you, that wasn't only just, this is like ancient history. We have to hang in there for a while, the 31st of August, 1967, stands out in my mind as though it were etched in crystal. I can look at every detail, but I can run forward, backward, fast motion, stop action. The 31st of August, 1967, I was somewhat younger, naval aviator. I was flying an A-4 off the Oriskany. We were in the Gulf of Tonkin, about 60 miles from the coast of North Vietnam. The 31st of August, 1967, in the Gulf of Tonkin, was one of those gray, hazy days at sea. It was the kind of day when you stand up on the flight deck and look out, there's no horizon, everything's the same color. Kind of goes from over your head to under your feet. We manned airplanes about 7 o'clock in the morning, launched 18 from the ship, rendezvoused overhead, got ourselves organized, pointed the noses toward the coast of North Vietnam. The target that day was a small railroad bridge just inland from the port city of Hai Phong. We crossed the beach, they started shooting. They always started shooting. And that day, I remember very clearly, from way, way out in front of us, they fired in succession two surface-to-air missiles. Now, back in the day, a surface-to-air missile was about the size of a telephone pole. And when they'd launch, there would be so much dust and flame kicked up from just getting them off the rails that from altitude, we could see them launch them from miles away. And once they had them in the sky, 
the plume of flame on the booster rocket was so big and so bright, you just tracked them through the sky. So I sat in my cockpit that day, and I watched the first missile. It's just a little bitty point of light sitting on my windshield, and it just sat there. And it's getting bigger and brighter and bigger and brighter, till finally it started to move on the windshield. Uh, and as soon as it started to move on the windshield, I knew that it would or would not hit me. Would? Would not? Would? This is a very important question we're dealing with here. So is this thing going to hit me? This is the Navy League, by the way. Is this thing going to hit me or not? No, it's not going to hit me. Yes was a good guess, but it was wrong. Um, it's, a, it's a relative motion problem. It's like when you try to get on a freeway. As long as all those cars move relative to each other, there's no problem. It's when there's no relative movement, we have real big problems. So that thing starts moving. I knew it wouldn't hit me. Then I turned my attention to the second missile. It's just a little point of light sitting there and getting bigger and brighter and bigger and brighter and bigger. Till finally I decided if it wouldn't move, I would. And that day I had a brilliant idea. You probably had ideas like this. They sort of come to us in a flash. You know, all of a sudden we know the reason. For it. What I decided to do, rather than go to my left and have to dodge through 16 airplanes that were out here somewhere beside me, I decided to just roll this thing up on its back, go across the top of the only airplane on the right side, come down on the outside, press onto the target. And it was a great idea until I was upside down over this airplane beside me. The missile went right between us. There was a huge explosion. Fireball blew the sail to tail section off my airplane. airplane. I didn't know that, by the way. Airplane just stayed on its back, started spinning and tumbling and gyrating and falling through the sky. It was shaking so bad, nothing would focus. When I felt the instrument panel seal was going on, it was just a blur in the cockpit. The stick was real loose. It was like not connected to anything anymore. Both rudder panels were up against the firewall. This thing was wallowing and tumbling and falling through. I had all the flying characteristics of a brick. I mean, this thing is coming through the sky like a ton of lead. And I'll tell you this, every time the nose of that airplane go by the water, and for me, the water meant safety. It seemed like it would hesitate. And I would think to myself, this thing is gonna fly. And then the nose would, I'd start trying to, and the nose would whip off, going through 4,000 feet, I got a glimpse of my altimeter, ejected from the airplane, had a parachute, landed in the middle of a small North Vietnamese village. Now, when I first landed, there was nobody around. I, they were wherever they went for air raids. I don't know where they were. I got rid of my helmet and my parachute. I ducked out between the hooches, and I started running out across the rice paddy. And as I'm running out across the rice paddy, I, and, uh, and running's probably not the right word for what you do in a rice paddy. You know, the mud's about this deep out there, and I'm slugging my way through it. And, I'm, and as I'm going through it, I can look up, and I can see those airplanes flying away. So I'm running, th I'm trying to get through this rice paddy, I get to about the middle of the rice paddy, and I can see that one of those airplanes is turning around, and he's coming back. So I stopped right there. I started digging around in my gear, and I dug out a little radio that we carried. Now, this little radio is about the size of maybe three or four iPhones glued together, and, and I had had this radio in my hands a lot of times. The Navy used to make us get out, get it out every few weeks on the ship and check them. We used to play with them on the ship. I had had this radio in my hands a lot. But now I'm standing out in the middle of a rice paddy. I have mud up to the middle of my calves. I'm watching that airplane. He's coming right straight at me. I'm just wondering, for the life of me, I couldn't get the radio turned on. It was like I had all thumbs on both my hands. I'm watching him, and he's getting closer, and I'm trying to get this. It, this is not a complicated machine. <laughs> It only has like two little switches on it, but I can't get him in the right sequence. And he's getting closer and closer until finally, I promise you, by blind luck, about the time he boomed across the top, I managed to mash down on the right buttons, combination of buttons on that radio, and it sparked to life. Which allowed me to say, in my very finest airline pilot drawl, <laughs> And I started babbling in this radio. And my voice was up about three octaves. And it was just all gushing out of me. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, this does not sound good. But there was nothing I could do about it. I just babbled in that radio. I went on. And, oh, by the way, I was trained that it would have been better for me to die than to not sound good on the radios. This is important pilot stuff that's going on. But there was nothing. I babbled and babbled every day. I went on. And the best thing that happened was I ran myself out of breath. And when I ran myself out of breath, I had to pause the inhale. And when I paused the inhale, I let off one of those buttons on that radio, 
Would you allow Dean then to get a word in edgewise? And he said, you know we cannot come and get you. At which point I couldn't think of anything clever to say. And Dean said, I'll see you when this is over. And he flew away. And I stood out there in the middle of Rice Paddy. I don't know how to describe it to you. It was like I was the only person in the entire intergalactic universe. It was just me out there by myself, all alone. There was no one. It was. And I don't think I've described that to you too much. Because I'd be willing to bet money that we've all had some times in our life when you get that alone feeling. I mean, stuff happens. Sometimes you got to make decisions. Sometimes you got to stand up and be kind. Sometimes you get the feeling like there ain't nobody, just you, all alone, all by yourself. Well, I wasn't alone for very long, of course. The next thing that happened was I was immediately drug up at Rice Paddy, and they, I was surrounded by about <clears throat> one million North Vietnamese. <laughs> uh, maybe that's exaggeration. 827,000 of them. I don't know where they came from. They captured me so fast to make your head swim, they drug me up at Rice Paddy, and they proceeded to tie me up with miles and miles of rope. I had rope everywhere. There was so much rope wrapped around me. And then after they'd been all tied up with all this rope, they decided they wanted to undress me. And they didn't untie me, but they took a machete made out of leaf spring of a car, and they would reach in between the rope and grab handfuls of my gear and just chop it away. And they chopped it away to end up being me, my miles and miles of rope, and my undershorts. And that started for me what would turn out to be only five and a half years in prison in North Vietnam. The question I most frequently ask about that is this. How did you do that? How could you do that? How were you able to do that? And that's the question I would like to talk with you about for a few minutes this afternoon. How do we do that? Actually, I'd like for you to think about that question. How do we do that? Here, I'll set the scene for you. I was kept locked up for years in cells that were never quite big enough for the number of people who were in them. On average, I probably lived with about six or seven or eight other guys. I've been by myself for a few months. I lived with a group of 20 men one time for a year and a half. But on average, probably six or eight of us in these cells. And a lot of them were cells, too. They were uh, dungeon in dungeon-like prisons that the French had built over there in the early 1900s. The kind of things you see in the movies where they got big high walls, little air slits up at the top, um, big heavy doors with a little spy door in them. We slept just on concrete floors or on pallets made out of wood or concrete. Uh, some of the pallets had um, shackles on them or whatever you call that. The kind of thing if they wanted to, they put you on the pallet, put your legs across the bar, put the top bar down and padlock you to the pallet. Uh, we were interrogated on occasion, uh, beaten on rare occasion, Tortured on very, very rare, rare occasion. Um, I weigh about 200 pounds now. At the time, I got down to about 125 pounds. Um, we were not allowed to see or have any contact with any Americans outside of our own self. They wanted this to be, they believed in divide and conquer. And they, we were, they wanted this to be, have us be isolated cell by cell by cell. Um, can you guys picture what I'm trying to describe? You see enough movies, you can picture this, groups of Americans locked up in these cells. Just picture a bunch of us locked up in here somehow. And uh, so the question I said I'm most frequently asked is, how do you do that? How were you able to do that? And I gotta tell you that in my mind, the answer to the question is very, very simple. How do we do it? We did what we had to do, we did our best, we decided to grow through that experience, we kept our sense of humor, and we kept the faith. Faith in ourselves, faith in each other, faith in this country, faith in God. See, and I, by the way, I see those things as directly translatable into your lives. I mean, how do you deal with your problems? How are you gonna deal with the tragedy that's coming in your life? How do you, choose, how do you exercise the influence you have? How do you, you do what you have to do, you do your best? You growing through all this stuff? Do you keep your sense of humor? Do you keep the faith? Uh, but wait, before I press you too hard, I use some answers. How do we do it? Well, the first thing we decided we had to be able to do, uh, and I don't know how we knew this, uh, was communicate amongst these cells. They want us to be cut off and isolated, cell by cell by cell. 
we somehow we knew that we couldn't allow we we couldn't let that happen. We had to be able to communicate amongst ourselves. I don't know why that was. See, I'd like to be able to tell you it was because we were so smart. Um, you probably wouldn't believe that. It'd be a hard sell. I, somehow it was like instinct. We knew we had to be able to be in touch with each other. So we could actually we could think about that for a minute here this afternoon. You have the picture in your head, groups of Americans locked up in these cells. Just picture a few of us locked up in here. We decide we got to see if we can get in contact. We got to see if we can communicate with people around us. Now there are many parts to the problem. The first part to the problem is whatever we decide to do had better be very sneaky because if they catch us, they're going to beat us. So what we decided we could do that would be very sneaky would be to go over there and tap very quietly on that wall. That'd be sneaky. Next part of the problem is we must now think of something to go over there and tap quietly on that wall so if we get the right answer we would know that's an American. May not be Americans over there. Could be Thai, Lotion, Arvid. Could be our captors sneaking around trying to catch us doing these things so they come beat on us for a while. So we need to think of something we can tap on the wall so if the answer is correct, we know immediately that's an American. What does that sound like? Code. What's that sound like? Morse code. Um, Morse code presented a problem for us. I knew Morse code, of course. I used to have to take tests on Morse code. And I know telegraphers can do the dot dash thing somehow with a little key. But us thumping on these walls, we were never able quite to figure out how to thump uh, dots and dashes. Uh, but that's a, you work on that for a while. Other ideas. I need to tap something so if the answer is right, I know. What does that sound like? The song. What song? What? The Navy hymn? Can you tap that on the table? <laughs> Ah, it sounds like da 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 da. I tell you this: if you've been in this country longer than six months, you know the answer to that is da da. I don't know why that is. See, I used to think it was because of Burma shave. Now I'm going to tell you what: there are people now who don't know what Burma shave was, but uh, I'm, I now believe it's because we have all wasted hours of our lives watching those cartoons, and they always ended with da 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 da. Um, I'll tell you something else now. You have to remember, my experience in Hanoi is through a keyhole in a prison, but they couldn't replicate that rhythm. Oh, they knew what we were doing. They beat it out of us. But when they come around and try to tap us up on the wall and get us in trouble, it never sounded like da 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 da, -da when they did it. It'd be different. It'd be like da 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 or something. It was just, they didn't have Looney Tunes in that country, you know. <laughs> Okay, so now we go over the wall, we tap, dot, 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 we get the answer, dot, dot, we know that's an American. What would you do next? Do you have this picture in your head? Can you picture yourself up against the wall? He's there. What would you do? It's okay, we have a lot of time. <laughs> How, how, what would you do? How would you do this? Now, picture yourself on the other side of the wall. I'm going to start. It's going to go like this. One, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll go all the way to 26, and I'll stop, and I'll start all over again. One, one, two. So I'm going to start. One for the letter A, two for the letter B, three for the letter This has to be very simple. Some of these guys are in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Some of them are. Some of them are even in the Air Force, if you can picture this whole thing. So we go over and we tap one for letter A, two for letter B. I can't tell you how old it gets. Tap 15 times on that wall to go find the letter O in the alphabet. And not only that, in our alphabet, the really good letters are down there towards the end someplace. So the next thing we did was, picture this in your head, we built a five by five matrix into which we put the letters of the alphabet. Now you know 
that I have 25 squares and 26 letters I have to deal with. Not everybody knows that, but we know that, okay? And so now I'll use the letter C for the letter K. Everything will fit in the box. A, B, C, K, D, E, F, G. You can picture this. So now I could tap a number across the top, a number down the side, locate a letter in the matrix. It was, that code was so good. We go, it's probably why we didn't bother to do Morse code on the walls, because we had this thing and it worked. So we go 30 words a minute. We were the original text messengers. And, and that code was so good, we use it for everything. It, they take you out and give you the bamboo broom and tell you to sweep down a walkway in between these buildings. You can sweep in the code. See it sound like this. It was like being on the radio. Everybody listened. The whole world was out there. You could tell jokes, whatever you want to do. They were waiting to hear from you. And then if they took us out, did not give us the bamboo broom. We did it with body noises. Not the kind of body noises some of you are thinking about. But it sounded like... <coughs> We'd cough and hack and sputter and spit. You get in a punchline to your joke. The whole world was out there waiting to hear from us. How do we do it? First thing we did was worked out this communications process. And I want to tell you this afternoon that I think the analogy between the story I want to tell and your work and your lives is really very, very good. This is super stuff. So here we are, we're locked up in these cells. They want us to be cut off, isolated, out of touch with each other. Here you are, in the places where, we don't call them cells, places where you work and live. Now there is no plan to cut you off, isolate you, get you out of touch with people, but I know when I start asking the question like this, hey, how easy is it for you to start to feel disconnected from the people around you? How easy is it for you to start to feel out of touch with people that are important to you? Those of you who are you're working, how easy is it for you to start to feel isolated and alone? And It is so easy for us to start to feel out of touch. And I, Why should we be concerned about that where we were? Well, for starters, if we're going to do anything on a kind of scale larger than a few of us locked up in one of these cells, we've got to be able to communicate. If we're going to get organized here, figure out who's in charge, what's the purpose of all this, how do we help each other, what are we, anything. On any kind of scale, we have to be able to communicate. Why should you be concerned that, with that where you are? I think the answers are exactly the same. They're precisely the same. How difficult was that process where we were? It, it, it was hard. Uh, I used to have a callus on my knuckles about three-eighths of an inch deep from tapping on that wall. And some days, if they want to mess with us, they'd come around and make you hold your hands out. If you had calluses, they'd knock you around for a little bit. Now, I thought that would be okay on a rare, rare occasion rather than every day for hours lay on this filthy floor trying to look under that door. Because if, if, if I'm up here tapping on the wall, none of my roommates and cellmates are goofing off. We are in this together, and we're taking care of each other. They've got their eyes pressed to the little cracks in these doors, and they're laying on these filthy floors trying to listen for footsteps for hours on it. It was just a very difficult process. How difficult is that process where you are? Well, you know, there are some people who want to argue that the root cause of all of our problems is some sort of break in the communications process. Now, I don't go quite that far, but I do know if I ask a question like this, how many of us in this room think that you can say something and that's the way it'll be? See, you know better than that. We say things till we're blue in the face. We say them over and over and over again. Or worse yet, of course, nowadays, we send text messages, we send emails out there, we leave voicemails. People are out there. They're deleting this stuff. They're swearing the system doesn't work for you. It's a very difficult process. So I think the analogy is pretty good between the story I want to tell and your work in your lives. How we do it? First thing we did was worked out the communications process. <clears throat> Always. Hey, I commend that to your thinking. See, I don't know y'all. I don't know how it is with you. I'm going to tell you what I do know. What I do know is this. If the communications process is not working well for you, anywhere in your life, I know who has to fix it. You do. And if you don't fix it, it's not going to get fixed. You can quit complaining. you got to belly up to it and fix it. 
hey, there's no way that anybody can fix it for you. You have to do it. How do we do it? First thing we did was worked out the communications process. Second thing we did, exactly the way you would have done it if you had been there, was we worked on the entertainment schedule. <laughs> now, you don't want to think too far out. These are just guys locked up in these cells. So here's the way we used to do that. We used to work on the entertainment schedule. We would have cell meetings. We always had 100% attendance at our meetings. <laughs> at those meetings, we would talk about movies, books, authors, stories. It would be enough for you to let slip that the last book you had read was... The last book you had read was... Gone with the Wind. Did you read that? Yes. Oh, cool. <laughs> if I wanted to get you up here and have you tell us about Gone with the Wind, how much time might you need? Oh, three hours. Three hours, that's good. If I wanted to schedule it next two months from now, how much time might you need? More. 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 Yeah, that's better. Okay, so that's the way it worked. You let slip, you and Red Gone with the Wind, we'll schedule you to tell us Gone with the Wind. Hey, we can do whatever. Next week, next month, six months from now, next year. We're in the long range planning. And so the process would then be talk to all your cellmates, find out who read Gone with the Wind, who saw Gone with the Wind, who knew anything about Gone with the Wind, go over and tap a message on the wall. Eventually, you knew everything anybody knew about Gone with the Wind. Then you could sit in the corner for however long you wanted, fill in the blank spots in the story. The appointed night would come and you would tell us a story. I received an Academy Award. It was for Dr. Chivago. After I'd been there for a number of years and I had told Chivago over, I, over to, I moved with this, I moved in with this group of 20 men I mentioned. My reputation preceded me. They wanted to know, when can you, when can you tell us you all go? <laughs> Any time. So we scheduled it for like uh, what used to be Sunday night at the movies. So, <clears throat> so I had three men. They sat over here. When I, I told them you all go in the first person. I had three men. When I nod my head, they would start up with Laura's theme. So I was Alec Guinness, the brother, out there searching for the lost daughter. I don't know if you remember, it took me five and a half hours to tell a story. At the conclusion of which, there was a spontaneous standing ovation to give him the Oscar right there on the spot. <laughs> How do we do it? We did what we had to do. We did our best. We were going to grow through that experience. Um, and so we began then to teach each other everything we had ever learned and quite a few things we had never learned. Um, I learned to play piano when I was in prison. I lived with a guy who had taken piano lessons as a child. We decided one day I should learn to play. So we took toilet paper, we glued it all together with rice, and we do, took ashes and dirt, we drew a keyboard on it. John taught me how to read the keyboard, he taught me how to read music, he taught me all the finger exercises that go along with playing the piano. I used to practice faithfully, and on Sundays, I would give concerts. So I would take my piano, I would spread it out on my end of that cell. I have played the most beautiful music in the world and I have most certainly played with more enthusiasm than anyone's ever played. My roommates, they loved it, of course. Well, if they didn't like what I was playing, they could listen to something else. So, you know, I'd play my heart out and they'd applaud like crazy. You know, in the intervening years since I've been home, I have seated myself in front of a real piano. I don't know what was wrong with that piano. <laughs> it wasn't like in my head. You know, in my head, I understand it, I can do it, I cannot get it out the ends of my fingers. It's, uh, it's perfect here, and I find a lot of things to be like that. Maybe you do too. Do you ever notice how perfect stuff is in your head? It's all perfect up here. You know what you're thinking, why you're thinking it, what your motivation is, everything. It's all up here. And then, of course, we have to get it out of here, and it's just a big downhill run. It, it's, things are just like that. They're, they're perfect here. And I have to, How many of you raised children? Hey, come on. See, I raised two children. In my mind, I knew how to raise perfect children. They had no idea what was going on at home. <laughs> Things are just that way. Speaking of perfect, I can tell you the perfect example. 
I told you when I stood up here, I was delighted to be here. It's very difficult for me to explain that to you, how excited I am to be here. Because you see today, in this little bitty period of time, I'm going to have an opportunity have a positive impact in your lives. So I've been thinking about this. I've been driving up here this morning, in the shower this morning. I've been going over my lines. I'm throwing lines out. I'm adding lines in. I'm trying to get my act together. And, and I want, no matter what happens in here, I want you to know this. In the shower this morning, it was perfect. <laughs> Things are just that way. <clears throat> it would have been enough over there for you to let slip you and take a biology course. <laughs> we'd make you the biology professor. Same sort of process as the movies, really. Talk to everybody. Find out what they know about leaves, twigs, bugs, worms. Go tap a message on the wall. Eventually, you'd start teaching the course. Um, I was a French professor. Uh, the way that happened was this. They came around one day, and they took two of us out. And they told us they had a guard listening outside this door, and he heard us talk about things we were not allowed to talk about. And I'll talk loud. <clears throat> we were not allowed to talk about. And uh, so they split us up, and they began to beat them. Six weeks later, when they dumped the two of us back in the cell, the roommates wanted to know what's going on. He said, you ain't going to believe this. They're listening outside the door. They don't understand English very well, and we are getting hammered for what they think we're saying. <laughs> So we came to the only logical conclusion, which was we would quit speaking English. <laughs> what we decided to speak was French. I didn't teach the French course yet. French. I didn't teach the French course yet. Pig Latin. Pig Latin. What we decided to speak was Pig Latin. We set aside a whole evening to review the rules for the grammatical construction of Pig Latin. It takes one minute. <laughs> next, next morning, crack of dawn, we started speaking nothing but pig Latin. I don't know if you've ever spoken nothing but pig Latin. I can tell you how long you can speak nothing but pig Latin before you go start raving men. It, it takes about four hours. In the middle of all that, I let slip that I'd taken French. I had two years in high school, two years at the Naval Academy. My roommates, who were going crazy trying to speak pig Latin, decided we should immediately shift to French. It didn't matter, mind you, I didn't learn anything in those four years. <laughs> so I quick go tap a message on the wall, say, I'm now the French professor, who knows French words, I need vocabulary, and I began to teach French. And I taught French for years. By the time we came back to the United States, I had six men, absolutely fluent, in the French language. Amazing. According to me. <laughs> hey, there are some problems with that language. I had to make some stuff up. <laughs> you should have heard them speak. <laughs> How did we do it? We did what we had to do. We did our best. We grew through that experience. We re-remembered and memorized everything. I am completely convinced that everything you have ever been exposed to is recorded. The only question is, are you going to get it? It's all up there. Everything is up there. We've been putting it in. We're putting it in. It's all up there. Everything. You, you'd be totally amazed what you could remember if I took you out there in that bathroom and locked you up for a year. You'd be amazed what you could remember. Everything's there. Uh, for example, for, well, it was important to us, for example, be able to name in chronological order every teacher you ever had in your life. Or the name of every student in your third grade homeroom or something. It's all there. It's all there. Um, for example, when they, when they first captured me, they took me to Hanoi. And uh, they began to interrogate me. They wanted to know some stuff. I wanted to tell them my name, right, serial number, date of birth. They really wanted to know some stuff. And what happened was the interrogations led to beatings. And eventually the beatings led to torture. And finally, we got, we got to the point where I hurt so bad, the pain was so great, that I knew if this kept up, that I was going to go crazy. And I didn't want to go crazy. Because even as a junior officer, I thought Lily would be a share of military secrets, and I thought if I'm crazy, there's no telling what I'll say to these people. So what I decided I was going to do was hold out to the last possible second and lie. And that's what happened. We got to the last possible. And hey, I'd like to be able to tell you it took weeks. It took weeks. 
It took, I don't know how long it took, a, a, a day or two, I lose some track of time in there. But we got to the point where I was so desperate, I hurt so bad, I knew I had to do something, I started lying. I lied about everything you can possibly imagine. The interrogators, of course, inter how many of you have experience with interrogators? Uh, never mind, I'll teach you some stuff about interrogators. They never, actually I wouldn't be so quick to answer that question. How many of us have spouses? <laughs> how many of us have had bosses? Okay, it's, this won't be foreign to you. Interrogators never forget anything, so I'm lying about everything. Finally, they got done with me, and they left. Now, I'll try to describe this to you. I don't know how to tell you about how I hurt. I could not get up off the floor. My arms didn't work anymore. My arms didn't work for weeks and weeks and weeks. I ate by just wiggling around in my stomach, stick my face in a bowl of rice. The pain was absolutely incredible, but worse than the pain was in my head. It's the only time that I've ever been like this in my life where I could not pick a subject and think about it. It was though I didn't have any control in it. Just my mind was out of control. Things were just flashing around in my head. Crazy stuff like the, the dog I had when I was a kid or the first car I bought or my home in Jeanette. Just out of control things flying around in my head. Um, it, into my mind came the first line of the 23rd Psalm. And that line kept coming into my head, the Lord is my shepherd. And I, did, I didn't want to think about it, but I discovered, kind of I hit or I miss, that if I would think about that line, the Lord is my shepherd, I could think about that line. When my mama didn't raise any dummies, I started thinking about that line. I worked on it for days and days. And I had learned the 23rd Psalm when I was a little bitty guy in Sunday school. And over the years, I had been adrift. I had been so far adrift. So I'm ashamed to stand here today and tell you that at that point in my life, it had been years and years since I thought of the 23rd Psalm. But that line was there. And I could think about that line. And I worked on it for days and days until from some place, in the back of my head, I dredged up the whole 23rd Psalm. And I discovered once I had done that, I had control of my mind back. Now, I don't think that was any accident. There was a you know, Scripture tells us over and over and over again, God is faithful. Amen. Not you. Not me. God is faithful. And there was the Word of God planted in my mind so that when I would be so desperate, it would be there. See, everything's in your head. You've been putting it in all your life. See? And it answers the question, I th some of the questions I think we keep asking, like... Um, why should we be concerned about uh, the lyrics to the music that our children or grandchildren listen to, or maybe some of you? I'll tell you why. It's because it's going in. What's going in is getting stored. What's getting stored is going to flavor character and life. There's no way around it. It's all there. What's the problem with pornography? I'll tell you the problem. It's going in. What's going in is getting stored. What's getting stored is going to flavor character and life. There's no way around it. Everything is in there. It's all of them. We had a fellow who lived with us who, when he was a child, his parents used to insist, they insisted that every year he had to, he had to memorize a poem which he would recite at the annual family Thanksgiving dinner. He hated it, of course. But now, years later, we're sitting around in uh, prison, and uh, Norm was able to recall great quantities of poetry. We get a message come tap through the wall say, Norman is working on the highwayman. He's stuck on the line that comes after, plating a dark red love knot into her long black hair. Look it up. We love to get those messages. Mm -hmm. We could argue for, we could discuss for days <laughs> whether anybody ever heard of the highwayman, knew anything about the highwayman, and then we'd just make up lines and send them to the <laughs> He's over there, and he's working hard, and we're trying to help him. And eventually, through the wall, a line at a time, would come the highway, and we'd memorize it as it came. We had huge quantities of material memorized. Uh, some of the things we memorized, we memorized for the beauty of the words. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest deep. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there had been some mistake. 
You know the other sound that's so sweet called the easy wind and down each way? Which is not dark and deep. But I have promises to keep. Miles to go before I sleep. Miles to go before I sleep. Some of the things we memorize, we memorize for the sound of the words. Um, you may talk a gin and beer when you caught it safe on here, when fetch a penny fighter all to shot it. But when it's time for slaughter, you'll do your work on water and blue flick the blooming boots of him what's got it. Now, Ninja Sunny Climb, where I used to spend my time in the service of Her Majesty the Queen, of all our black faced crew, the finest man I knew was the regimental beast of color, John Dean. Some of the things we remember I said great significance for us personally. Um, Maybe the way things go some days, they would have significance for you personally. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve their term long after they are gone, so go on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hang on. In the felt clutch of circumstance, I have not whined or cried aloud under the bludgeoning of chance. My head is bloody, but I'm bound. <coughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen. I suppose it was natural since we were so enamored with those kinds of things that we would try to write some poetry ourselves. I wrote a poem in French. <laughs> <laughs> Did any of you speak French? <laughs> Me? No? No. Nobody speaks French. Oh, we. Oui. We'll skip that. <laughs> I have a good friend I remember hit when he wrote his first poem was after the first meal of the day. John, uh, Jerry took a bite out of the hunk of bread. He looked down. He started his first poem. Went like this. Little weevil in this bread, I think it just bit off your head. <laughs> I kind of went downhill from that. <laughs> how do we do? We laughed a lot. See, laughter was kind of our coping mechanism. It was how we dealt with the pressure. It was how we tried to keep things in some sort of perspective. It's how... See, I wonder how you do that in your lives. I wonder how you keep things in some sort of perspective. I wonder how you deal with all the pressure. I wonder how you handle it all. I wonder how you keep things... There's something else I learned in prison. I learned that I, I, oh, I, I learned that the Lord God created the universe cares about my life, and He cares about your life. We don't have to do this by ourselves, but we got to do it because it's it is so easy to mess up on. How much you think it'd be uh, ruin relationships that are important to you? Pretty easy, I think. How easy are you supposed to be drink yourself into a bottle? <laughs> Pretty easy, I think. Somehow we got to do this whole coping thing. Somehow we got to keep things in perspective. But one of our little coping mechanisms was laughter. We had a fellow went to interrogation. The interrogator wanted to know, in your country, where does your family live? He told him, Kansas. He said, what do your family do? He said, they're farmers. He said, what do your family grow? He told him, they grow up dog. Later on, the interrogator took him to his cell, and he came over to our cell. The little spider opened up, right? And there stands the elf. We have names for these people. The elf that's in there, and he wants to know what's up, Doc? <laughs> what's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? He keeps saying what's up, Doc. He doesn't make a lick of sense, but I mean, he wants to know what's up, Doc. And then the next thing you know is you know, he, he starts to get excited, and, it, and he's got his head. It's not good, by the way, for interrogators, spouses, bosses to get excited. He's got his head jammed in that hole. He's spitting all over himself. He's, he wants to know what's up, Doc. Give us a hint. Give us a hint. Finally, he says, Up, Doc, you know, go to the farm in Kansas. Up, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Not just all. We 
would give him a recipe for hot dog bread. Whatever he wanted to learn, we're teaching. <laughs> How did we do it? We did what we had to do. We did our best to go through that experience. We kept our sense of humor, and we kept the faith. Faith in ourselves and our ability to endure. Got it out. The sun's coming up tomorrow. I'm going to be there. Faith in ourselves no matter what. Faith in ourselves. Be See, I say that directly translated words. Faith in yourself no matter what. Faith in yourself, be able to make decisions, do things you're going to have to do. Faith in ourselves. We do it through faith in each other. I looked at men who they know my life in their hands. They held the next best thing to it, and I knew they'd do the best that they could do. And when the situation was reversed, they granted that to me, that I would do the best that I could do. And it's that kind of faith and confidence in each other that allows us to live together, work together, be together effectively. It's all built on this foundation of trust. I did it through faith in this country. We live in the greatest nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth. Amen. This is a land of freedom. This is a land of achievement. This is a land of opportunity. This is the land. They're kicking the doors down trying to get in. This is the land. The problem is you and I are buried in what's wrong with this country. We are inundated. It's all out of proportion. It's all out of whack. It's all. Hey, hey, if you go, if you go home tonight and turn on the news, how much do you see about what's wrong with this country, and how much do you see about what's right with this country? I did it through faith in God. I've never was alone over there. I've lived with men who profess to be atheist and agnostic. I think it was more difficult for them. I don't think that was any accident. You know, the truth of the matter is this. You and I have been blessed. We've just been blessed. I mean, how do you account for it? How do you account for all you have and all you... Why are you not a, uh, a Ukrainian refugee? <coughs> how do you figure that? There's no figure. We've just been blessed. And I know as surely as I'm standing here, I don't deserve it. And I don't know you, but I've been looking at you for 45 minutes now, and I have decided, no, you don't deserve it either. <laughs> How do we do? We did what we had to do. We did our best to grow through experience. We kept our sense of humor. We kept the faith. What can be learned from my experience? Let me suggest one thing to you. All of my experience teaches me that no matter what happens to us in our life, we have been given the ability to choose how we're going to live those lives. That's right. We've been given the ability to choose. As much as we'd like to control everything, that's up. That's not going to happen. But we can then live our lives in ways that we choose. In the first line of A Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens wrote, it was the best of all times and the worst of all times. And he's absolutely right. You know that, don't you? This is the best of all times. Yeah. You'd be who you are living in the Dallas area or the Waco area, <laughs> being part of the Navy League, doing what you're doing. And oh, by the way, this is the worst of all possible times. You'd be who you are living in the Dallas area, doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It is. And which it is is up to us. Let me be perfectly clear. Which it is is entirely up to you. It's entirely up to you. So, as we leave here this afternoon, as you go back to your lives, as you go back into doing all the other things you do, I would urge you to always choose to make it the best of all times. The best of all times. Thank you very much. God bless. got his book, The Ways We Choose. See him. Let me tell you, it's worth it, especially to give to young people. Yeah, I have a few of them. They're 20 bucks. With my signature, they're $180. <laughs> <laughs>